Good evening, explorers! I'm Exploratory with the Nevada Conservation League, and welcome to another episode of Native Nevada Nature. If this is your first time, this is my weekly series to highlight one plant or one animal species that you can find right here in Nevada. This is an educational presentation for explorers of all ages that can um, that you can learn, watch, and explore all at once. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, today we're going to be talking about one particular animal, very special to the West. That's right, it's the desert tortoise. Um, it's very iconic here just because it's our state reptile, the state reptile of Nevada and California. <laughs> we're going to be talking specifically about the Mojave desert tortoise, which is Gophorus agassii. It is named after gophers, which are gopher tortoises. Um, they're named because their ability to dig large, deep burrows, um, just like a gopher would. They can build them up to about 40 feet in length and 10 feet in depth. Um, the agassii of their name is in honor of the Swiss American zoologist Jean Louis Rodolphe Agassi. Now I want to touch base a little bit on the differences between the Mojave and the Sonoran desert tortoises. Um, the Sonoran is Morcaflas desert tortoise. Um, they originally were thought to be the same species, just separated into two populations. But back in the 2000s, they discovered they were two separate species. Um, there are very little differences between the two and the shell shape and size. But the best way to tell them apart is just to find out where you're at. Mojave Desert Tortoise can be found right here in the Mojave Desert. The Sonoran Desert Tortoise in the Sonoran Desert. The Colorado River is the best divider. Um, one side is the Sonoran, the other side is the Mojave, and that is where their populations will not cross. Since we're talking about differences, I thought I'd let you guys know this. I get asked this question a lot as a biologist, especially for people who don't have either in their region. So what is the difference between a tortoise and a turtle? So tortoises have a more rounded shell, more domed shell, where turtles have a thinner water dynamic shells. They are more streamlined to aid in swimming, uh, which brings to the major key difference between tortoises and turtles is that turtles are, they can spend time on land and water. They spend most of their time on water and so you'll see Things like modified flippers, as in sea turtles. Um, sometimes they'll have webbed feet or feet that can be used to swim through the water. Whereas tortoises are purely terrestrial. Uh, you'll never find them swimming in the water. Their arms are very stumpy and small. Um, not very good for swimming. Uh, so that's the key difference. Um, the turtle is made for swimming and the tortoise is made for land dwelling. All right, let's talk about how to identify a desert tortoise, a Mojave desert tortoise. So tortoises are non-venomous herbaceous reptiles, meaning they don't have any venom like snakes, so they won't, you won't have to worry about that. They're herbaceous, which means they are vegetarian, so they're not gonna eat you either. <laughs> and they're reptiles. Um, that dome shape is a pre pretty good characteristic of a desert tortoise. They have an armored, armored arms. You can see those scales pretty heavily on their arms. And they have elephant-like legs, kind of little stumpy legs that they sit on top of that look like elephant legs. Their colors can be anywhere from an olive to a brown gray. Uh, sometimes when they're younger, they look a little bit more yellow colored. And sometimes they look more dirt colored because they spend a lot of time in their burrows with a lot of dirt. <laughs> Um, sometimes we call them in the field rock, a rock with legs because uh, they look just like what they do in their environment. You can see in the picture to the right hand side that that tortoise blends in with the rocks around it. So if it's standing still, sometimes it might just look like another rock. They can be anywhere from about a silver dollar size to about a foot, maybe 14 inches in length. Since we're talking about differences, I thought I'd let you guys know in the field how we tell them apart, males and females. 
once you're looking at them, walking around, if you're on a hike, it may be really hard to determine if what you're seeing is a male or female, especially when the differences are like small or short or long. Um, but this is what we use in um, field guides on how to tell them apart. So first off, the desert tortoise usually have gular horns. It's this uh, modified part of their shell that sticks up in front of and right below their neck. Uh, for males, it is enlarged and upturned. So you'll see this huge horn sticking out from below their neck. Whereas females, they'll usually have a very small gular, gular horn. It's not very big. Uh, males, they might have chin glands and especially during mating season, it'll be very thick, heavy chin glands hanging down. While as the females won't have any. Males have longer tails than females. And probably the best way to determine if you have a male or a female is to look on the underside. Like I said, this is really hard to do in the field unless you turn them around, which you should never do out in the wild. Um, but this is the clear way if you have a pet desert tortoise to tell if it's male or female. So males on the bottom of their shell, which is called the plastern, top of the shell carapace, bottom of the shell plastern, it is concaved. There's a little hole. Basically, it helps them mount the female during procreation. Whereas females don't need that, so therefore their plastern is going to be nice and flat. Um, so if you ever get the chance in a field setting to check that out, that's the easiest way to tell them apart. However, if you're unable to do that and you look at them from afar, it may be very hard to tell the difference between a male or a female. And juveniles, baby desert tortoises, will not show their male or female uh, appearance until they have matured, which is about 10, 15 years, depending on the amount of resources available to them. Um, so for a juvenile, they may look like females for most of their life and may not look more male uh, past until they've actually hit maturity. So here's a map to show the ranges for both the Mojave Desert Tortoise and the Sonoran Desert Tortoise. Um, it's pretty easy to see that the red is the Mojave Desert Tortoise. It encompasses the entire Mojave Desert, which is southeastern California, the southern tip of Nevada, and the small little corner of Arizona and Utah. Um, you can see from this picture that the Sonoran Desert Tortoise has a much larger range and capacity than the Mojave Desert Tortoise. So it's a very limited area, especially since a lot of that area is inhabited by people. All right, let's talk about the habitat. So desert tortoises can live in a variety of types of habitats from sandy flats to rocky foothills, um, but it's all based off of one very important thing, their soil, the soil there. Um, as you can see in this picture, that desert tortoises will build their burrows, their dens, and they need suitable soil in order to build a suitable den. Um, they need soils that are very strong and solid so that they can keep their shape when they build it and form it. But it also needs to be soft enough that they can dig through and dig holes through. If it's too hard, too uh, caliche, then they won't be able to get through to it. So a lot of times uh, they will be with areas with nice soil they like washes and canyons, where it makes it very easy to dig through the soil. Um, in areas like rocky foothills, where it's pretty much impossible to dig through rock, they will usually just find a den under a very large rock and kind of hang out there. In caliche, where it's too hard to dig through, they might do the same thing, find a caliche den. Um, but they're looking for nice soil that um, can regulate temperature, regulate water loss, and uh, keep them cool in this habitat. They'll spend about 80 to 95 percent of their time in a burrow, so it's very important that they build it well for them to survive. By the way, this picture is a classic example of a desert tortoise burrow. If you see that half moon shaped, which is the shape of their shell, the little dome shell, um, then you have a pretty good indication that either this a desert tortoise lives there or it recently abandoned it or abandoned this burrow. Um, so if you see that half moon shaped as you're walking around on uh, hikes, just make sure to avoid those areas, leave the desert tortoise alone, especially if they're in the winter time. All right, let's talk about the life of a desert tortoise. What is it like to be a desert tortoise? 
Um, so just like most reptiles, they hibernate in the winter. Um, for desert tortoises, they actually don't hibernate, they brumate. It's called brumation. The difference being is that hibernate is a state of when you're sleeping. Um, you uh, collect all these calories, you know, like bears, they'll eat so much and then sleep throughout the whole entire winter. Whereas tortoises, they are actually not sleeping. They're just in very low activity, so they won't move. Um, they won't uh, do much activity so that they can maintain all the resources throughout the winter time. But they are awake and they can emerge if they want to, especially if there's rain, the uh, rainy season in the winter time. So they'll come up and get some water and go back down. But um, usually they'll spend their time in their burrow. They'll emerge at about April, March, depending on the temperature. And they'll go back down for the winter time at about December, November, when it gets too cold for them. They can't handle the cold at all. Um, they prefer temperatures at about 60 to 90 degrees. That's when they'll hang out. They'll emerge in the springtime when there's plentiful of food. They love flowers, and so they come when the springtime flowers bloom. So they'll move around in the nice parts of the day, eating, collecting water, um, even just hanging out, looking around. After about 90 degrees, especially during the summer, they'll retreat either under shade or um, under a rock. And then once it gets way too hot, they'll go back in their burrow for the night or for the rest of the day if it gets way too hot in the summer. Like I said, they'll spend a lot of their time in their burrow. Uh, so if it's way too hot for them, um, you may not ever see them. But let's talk about mating because that's one thing that does happen. So this is a picture I actually got of two desert tortoises mating. It was a really cool experience. Uh, so the female, or the female will sometimes resist the male's call. Um, in this picture right here, the male was trying to persuade the female into procreation. He can, he'll like nip at her, make calls to her, sometimes bite her. Sometimes there's these blood rings, which is the male trying to push the female into mating. Um, but once mating happens, it usually happens good, about the good times of year, springtime, um, springtime, fall time when their flowers are around. If there is a male, the male will engage in a male-to-male -male combat to compete for the female. That's what the gular horns for. The, the males will combat each other and try to knock each other over using their horns, trying to bite and push them over. And if you've ever seen on TV that when a desert tortoise or a tortoise in general is on their back, um, it's pretty scary business. So uh, the, fem the males will compete and the dominant one will get to mate with the female. The female can lay her eggs any time of the year. They usually do it in springtime or fall time when uh, the, night, the air is nice, the, it's nice and cool. Uh, they will lay their eggs and either she will bury it in front of her den in the back of her den or by a nearby tree. Sometimes she will defecate on it to uh, distract predators from it and then she will usually abandon her young. The clutch or the hatchlings will emerge about 90 to 120 days after they were born, helpless on their own. The life of a hatchling is very, very hard. They say at about 97% of the hatchlings are they die um, and never make it to adulthood. So that means that if you were to have 100 eggs in your lifetime, that maybe three of them would have reached adulthood. So it's very rough life and that's usually just because they're soft, soft bodied. Um, you see in these guys, usually they have hard shells as adults, but as hatchlings, they don't get that hard shell until maybe about three or five years old. It takes a while. So until then, they're very much vulnerable to the outside world and predators. All right, let's talk about desert tortoises in the community. Um, so first off, they love to eat plants. They love cacti and flowers, a little bit of grasses. They will eat shrubs if necessary, even though it doesn't digest very well, but cacti and flowers are their favorite thing to eat. They are very good at maintaining shelters for not only themselves, but other habit or other wildlife. Um, their desert, the burrows, they can share with various mammals, reptiles, birds, invertebrates. Um, some of them include the white-tailed antelope squirrel, wood rats, burrowing aloes, quail, rattlesnakes, gila monsters, 
beetles, spiders, scorpions. Yes, they will either share their den with these lovely animals, or a lot of times if they abandon the den or move on, um, these guys will inhabit it when it's, they're no longer there. So it's harsh out here in the desert, so the desert tortoise definitely provides shelter for many of our wildlife out here. But it's all not nice and peachy. There are some native predators out here for the desert tortoise. We have Gila monsters, kit foxes, badgers, roadrunners, coyotes, even fire ants. Um, they will predate on the desert tortoises. They will usually eat the eggs or the small juveniles. Ravens are a huge problem for desert tortoises. Um, na ravens aren't native here. They were brought in by people. And they have found that desert tortoises tend to be their new favorite snack. A lot of times you'll find baby juveniles with holes in the, on the top of their shell just from the ravens pecking at them and um, predating them. So ravens are, are thought to cause a significant decline in juvenile tortoises' populations across the Mojave Desert, especially in urbanized areas where they hang out. Speaking of urbanized areas, you can actually own a pet desert tortoise. I'm sure if you guys live in Nevada, you've seen people with desert tortoises, and you might be thinking, exploratory, that's weird. They're supposed to be endangered, right? <laughs> yes, they're one of the few um, threatened species that you can actually keep as a pet. This was because they were kept as pets before the ruling, and a lot of times when wild uh, desert tortoises get caught in urbanized areas because of the pathogens and diseases that we expose to them, they no longer are allowed to be released to the wild. We would not want to infect our diseases on wild populations. So there ends up being a lot of desert tortoises out that need homes. Um, if you find one in your backyard and it just comes up, uh, it suddenly is a pet tortoise. <laughs> the tortoise group is the only legal adoption agency for the desert tortoise here in Nevada. So if you are interested in adopting a desert tortoise, or if you already have one, you want um, advice on how to build a den, how to feed them properly, or if you found one randomly in your backyard, you think a wild one just wandered in, I re highly recommend contacting the tortoise group. They're a great, wonderful group. They do microchipping for the tortoises, health assessments, I've worked with them a couple of times, they're a great agency to contact. But let's talk about the cultural importance because desert tortoises have been out here in the West as long as people have. So really quick, this is a picture of a petroglyph in the South Mountain Park in Arizona. Right at the top is a desert tortoise. <laughs> so first they were used as food. <laughs> there have been remnants of desert tortoises that have been cooked and eaten and have been identified at many archeological sites across the desert. These sites include campsites, uh, large roasting pits, inhabited caves, rock shelters, residential structures. Everybody loved to dine on desert tortoises. You've probably heard that people used to make desert tortoise soup, or tortoise soup. Um, that used to be a real thing. <laughs> Sometimes even the tortoise shell was powder, grinded and powdered into a uh, powder that can be given as like a tea to relieve stomach and urinary tract afflictions among the Yamapai tribe. Tortoise shells were used as bowls, ladles, seed parching containers, spoons for children, scoops for digging, um, bowls, pretty much anything this shape, they're uh, very much useful in uh, indigenous tribes. A uh, slight curvature it helps in a lot of tool making for them. Um, even for ceremonial use reasons, um, the ra they made rattles out of them. They would put like seeds or uh, rocks inside the shells to rock it and make a rattle sound. Um, so they have reco recovered those at a lot of uh, ceremonial places across the West. Um, you can even find some in the uh, collections in the Palm Desert Museum, Palm Springs Desert Museum down in uh, California. But let's go back even further. Let's talk about the fossil record. Um, before we begin, I want to talk about these pictures. So the first one are fossil tortoises at the Cent Central N Natural Science Collections at MLU. And I just want to give you guys a clear picture on the skeleton of a desert tortoise. Sometimes people think that the shell is separate from the tortoise, but actually the shell is the tortoise. So you can see its skeleton and it built up the shell. And the 
inside is where it can hide in and keep all of its organs safe. <laughs> so all right, let's go back to the fossil record. So turtles, we'll start off with turtles. They are closest related to birds and crocodiles, actually. They are less related to lizards and snakes. Um, the first fully shelled turtle could be found 210 million years ago in the late Triassic area. After that, there was a family of turtles that originated in Asia, and they crossed over the Bering Strait. They moved across Europe, North America, and even Africa. The earliest tortoises uh, were found at about 34 to 37 million years ago. Our gopherous tortoises, or gopher tortoises, fossils have been found 35 to 33 million years ago. And those have been found in Wyoming, Colorado, Nebraska, and South Dakota. At about 10.5 million years ago, um, they believe that our iconic desert tortoise diverged from the Texas tortoises. And then they say that about 5 million years ago, the lineage of the Sonoran and the Mojave desert tortoises broke off into two separate species. So even though they're very much alike, they have been separated for almost 5 million years. And they do believe that it's because of the Colorado River dividing them. Um, so it's pretty cool to see how they've changed over the last 50 million years ago to the tortoises that we know today. All right, let's talk about the conservation status of the desert tortoise. Um, I'm sure you guys know how threatened the desert tortoise is. It's actually listed as threatened under the United States Federal Endangered Species Act and is considered vulnerable by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which is that picture I have right there. Um, there are many laws across multiple states to protect them, though the numbers show and my work has showed that it's still in decline, unfortunately. And it's all because of these three different reasons. So the first reason is predation. I already mentioned how ravens are devastating desert tortoise numbers. They're the newest predator out there and they're taking advantage of desert tortoises as much as they can. Second is disease. There is a disease called urinary, uh, what is it, URTD, Upper Respiratory Tract Disease, that is um, impacting desert tortoise populations. It's kind of like pneumonia, but uh, for tortoises. You'll see signs of it like puffy eyes, watery nose, snot bubbles, wheezing, hard breathing, um, and it's very much fatal and it passes through populations very quickly. So this is a huge problem for uh, this disease proliferating through this entire desert. Last but not least, human impacts. Uh, pretty much we took over their land. We've divided their land by putting highways and freeways, limiting their access to resources, to food, to burrows. Um, off-roading is a big problem. People who off-road don't follow trails could end up easily running over a desert tortoise. Uh, cattle grazing is a huge thing because cattle like to eat the same things that desert tortoises eat, limiting their food supply. Um, and then, you know, vandalism, habitat destruction, mining, all these different impacts that humans have definitely are hurting the desert tortoise. And there are, you know, recovery plans, Every time a highway or a project goes through, we have to have um, consideration for the desert tortoise protection. So there are things going on to help with their populations, but it definitely is not helping. So I wanted to give you guys some advice to work on desert tortoise conservation, desert tortoise safety. So if you were to see a desert tortoise, this is what you'll do. So first off, if you're on a hike and you see a desert tortoise far away, Please maintain social distancing. Leave it alone. Um, they have this thing where they will con they are very good, very efficient at keeping their water. Um, their pee is virtually dust because of how well they conserve their water. So they can hold their water for up to a year. But if they are spooked or scared, sometimes they will void their bowels and suddenly their entire year of water is gone. It's depleted. Um, and if they are unable to recover all of that water, they will die. So if you see a desert tortoise, leave it alone, let it do its thing, let it pass on by, and then you do your own thing. 
The only legal way you are allowed to interact with a desert tortoise is if it's in mortal danger. So if you are driving on the road and you see a desert tortoise crossing, first off, stop your car, allow it to pass. If it's under your car or it's in harm's way, you have a big giant tractor coming through that cannot move, then you are allowed to legally move it out of harm's way, you know, pick it up, don't turn it towards you, um, face it vertical, uh, face it horizontal, so parallel to the ground, and move it to the side of the road, allow the danger to pass, and then you move on your way. Um, so um, always be on the eye, look out for desert tortoises. We wanna help them out as much as we can, but make sure that if they are not in harm's way, you leave them alone and allow them to do their thing. We don't wanna expose any diseases or pathogens to them that might otherwise impact their survival. Um, this is a picture of what I had to do. This little guy was on the road as we were having construction go by, so I had to move him out of the way. <laughs> but does anybody have any questions on the desert tortoise or the Mojave in general uh, that I can answer for you? Uh, why don't they spend time taking care of their young? Uh, that's a very good question. I wanna say that's more of like an evolutionary trait um, it seems that none of the reptiles ever take care of their young and they um, abandon their nest. Uh, I think like crocodiles also lay eggs, but they also don't take care of their young. Um, it just seems to be an evolutionary trait that they all share. It might be that they're maximizing the amount of time that they can lay eggs. So it takes about 90 days for their eggs to lay and they don't need to sit there on the nest like a bird would need to, it stays warm under the dirt so they can leave the nest and go and try to have more uh, ki more eggs. Um, so they might try to procreate and move on and try to lay more eggs and increase the uh, amount of eggs that will make it to survival. So like I said, 97% fatality rate. So they're gonna wanna, their goal is to have as many eggs as they can. So they may, may have to sacrifice um, the parental care, the uh, need to take care of one egg um, one nest that may not make it to um, adulthood um, by having more eggs and increasing their chance of making it to adulthood. Um, the two species were split by the river. Are there any real differences? So as I said before, the differences are very min minimal. Um, I'll go back to that picture really quick just to show you guys of the Sonoran Desert Tortoise. Let's see. Um, so that's what it looks like. Um, they say that the differences, uh, the Sonoran Desert Tortoise has a much wider and box-like shell and longer gular scutes than the Mojave, while the Sonoran has a, a, has a narrower, flatter, pear-shaped shell. Um, so... <laughs> How do you tell box shape versus pear shaped? Uh, you might need to compare those two next to each other just to tell the difference. Um, they say that the Mojave lays between five and 16 eggs, whereas the Sonoran averages about five eggs, one to 12 eggs. Um, and when they breed or when they lay eggs is different because the Sonoran also gets uh, a lot more rain. Um, so they have that water availability as well. But other than that, um, most of their differences are through their DNA. So DNA analyzing has really been able to show that they are indeed two different populations. All right. <laughs> why is, <laughs> so I have a question. It goes, um, why is turtle sex so metal? <laughs> um, well, does a, surviving out in the desert is a hard thing. Um, you know, desert tortoises actually have a wide range. Some people think of them as sw sm uh, slow, just like the tortoise and the hare, but they, they actually move around quite a bit. Um, they can move anywhere from like a mile outside their den, and they want to increase their chances of, you know, having their kids live. So they're going to try to mate as much as they can. So tortoise, male tortoises will definitely compete, and they put their heart into it to try to have to mate with females as much as they can. Um, usually there'll be like a ba uh, bachelor in one area that uh, dominates and mates with all the females. Um, and he's usually, the, you know, the most 
has the largest gular scoot, you know, the biggest one, um, so he could take care of himself and compete with other males. So, uh, you know, it's harsh when only 3% of your eggs are going to live out here, so it's going to be, they're going to try to make it the best that they can. So they'll, you know, bite the females, they'll bite other males, you know, turn them over. Um, it's pretty brutal, but I guess it's necessary. <laughs> um... Let's see, I think that's the last of the questions I see. If anybody has any more, they're welcome to throw them out right now. If not, I'll move on to next week's activity. So each week we put out an activity that involves our next native Nevada nature species. And this week we are doing a selfie challenge. That's right. So we're going to be talking about the juniper, which is the iconic woodland tree that you can find all over Nevada. We're going to be doing a selfie challenge. So all you're going to do is, as you're going on your normal hikes, look around for some juniper. I put some descriptions in there as well. And take yourself a nice selfie with this nice little tree. As you can see in my picture right here with my selfie, <laughs> um, you can find them in a lot of montane areas, woody, woody areas, um, about three or 5,000 to 7,000 elevation. And they can be found all over Nevada, um, the entire state. So keep an eye out for them. If you take a cool selfie with them, send them to the Nevada Conservation League and you may be featured on next week's episode. But please maintain social distancing while you're out in the wild. As you can see from my selfie, I make sure to wear my face mask anytime I'm around people. And I always maintain at least six feet of distance between anybody on the trails. Um, but have fun taking your selfies. I can't wait to see your guys' pictures. And tune in next week as we talk about the juniper. Um, thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed this presentation on the desert tortoise. Uh, I love talking about desert tortoises just because I personally got to work with them. So if you have any further questions, you can put them down in the Facebook comment section if you're watching this live. Um, but if not, I'll see you every Wednesday at 5 p.m. And we'll be talking about one other plant or animal species. Please give us a like or a comment if you enjoy this presentation so we know that we can continue to do this in the future. Um, but until next week, keep on exploring.